Good morning. You might take your Bibles and turn to Matthew 18. That'll be one of the first passages that we look at. Uh, first one that we take a sustained look at anyway. It is good to see you. We have uh, just about nearly a full building, and so we are thankful for that. Mindful of those who are not here with us and uh, praying for their, their soon return. Several months ago, um, I, I had a few lessons on the subject of Bible authority. And uh, took a break from that for different lessons. And uh, somebody, uh, Alan asked a question um, as we were going through that study that I thought was important that we think about. Uh, and I had had I had planned to talk about it at some point, and uh, his question uh, maybe gave me uh, affirmation that that was something we needed to to discuss. And I want to think about for a little while this morning uh, the individual and the church and making distinctions between how we apply the principles of Bible authority to whether or not we're talking about an individual uh, or talking about a local congregation. And when I say making distinctions, I don't mean that we apply those in different ways particularly, but how do we know when an individual is authorized or permitted to do something versus when we can do something as a local church? And so uh, there, there are some things I think that need to be said about that from time to time. So, so far, and so this is a couple of months ago, so you'll just have to take my word for it that we did talk about all these things. Uh, if you want uh, to follow up on any of these things or have further questions, I'd be happy to share with you my notes or sit down and talk with you about them. Because what I've tried to do is build from the very beginning. Just start with the fact that God it has the right to command and expect to be obeyed because he's the creator and he's the redeemer. Uh, somebody has said that we are twice his, right? He's, we are his because he made us and we are his because he has redeemed us. And so he has the right to expect obedience out of us as his creation and as his purchase. Jesus, being the full revelation of God, has the right to command not only as creator and redeemer, but because he's been enthroned as Lord and Christ. That he's the rightful ruler of the universe by virtue of his death and resurrection. He sits at the highest place in all of creation. And so, God's people, those who are truly his, have always been characterized by a desire to know God's will and to obey it from the heart and not be directed by their own will or wisdom. Uh, as we sang in the song just a moment ago, or we want our spirit yield, to yield only to God. That He is the one who directs us. That He's the one who points us in the direction we need to go. Now, because God's will is made known only and exclusively and fully in the Scriptures, we have to go back to the Bible in order to find out what we want to do, what, what we need to do, what God wants us to do in order to be pleasing to Him. And based on what we see in the Old Testament, both in principle and in example, and what we see from Jesus' example and what we see from the writing of the New Testament, we know from the Scriptures that in order to be pleasing to God, we must have authority. We must have permission to act. Remember, we were studying in 2 John just a couple of classes ago. And John says in 2 John 9, Whosoever goes too far and does not abide within the doctrine of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides within the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. That is a principle that we see show up throughout the New Testament of there's a boundary marker set. And we need to stay within what God has instructed us. And God tells us what He wants by telling us, by saying things, by showing us examples of people that are pleasing to Him, by, by implying things to us. And sometimes what God does is He gives us general instructions and leaves us the discretion of figuring out how we're going to carry that out. But sometimes he's very specific about what to do. And we don't have a lot of discretion in how, how we carry that. Uh, and something that helps us to carry out what God has instructed us to do is an aid. But once we start doing things, using things that cause us to do something other than what God has asked us to do, now we're in the territory of additions and going beyond. Now, I realize that all of that is... Uh, that was uh, six lessons of material that I just tried to summarize. So if there's questions about that, I would be happy to talk about that more. But in our discussions about Bible authority, it is necessary to make a distinction 
between what God permits individuals to do with their money and their resources and what God permits churches to do with their money and their resources. Because local churches, like this one, have a specific work that they are called to do. And just because you and I as individuals can do something with our tools and our resources does not mean that the church can do that. Now, what I don't want you to think about this is that doesn't make those activities immoral. It doesn't make them ungodly. It doesn't make them wrong. It doesn't make them bad. It just means that churches are limited to the tasks that God has given them to do. And we, we find that, we base that premise on the very idea that if God has not given us the authority to do something, then we don't do it. So let's start off with some definitions. First of all, when I'm using the word church this morning, primarily I'm talking about in terms of a local congregation like Quinn. So the word church is, is used in different ways in the Bible, but there's two major ways. One way is to talk about all the saved of all time in all places living and dead. So remember in Ephesians 1 when Paul writes and says that God put all things under Jesus' feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. In that instance, Paul is not talking about one local congregation. He's talking about all the saved. Jesus is the head of the church, his body. All the people who have ever lived, who have been in a right relationship with God through the blood of Christ. That's the church. That's the body of Christ. But there are other ways, the, the, the other primary way in which the word church is used in the New Testament is to talk about a local congregation. Uh, so think about Romans 16, verse 16. He says, the churches of Christ salute you. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, he's not saying there are multiple bodies of all the saved people. That doesn't even make sense. All the saved people have to be in one body. But he is talking about local groups of those people that live in relatively close proximity to each other, that live at about the same time. Well, they, they have to overlap at least a little bit. They agree to work together under ideally the oversight of elders. They worship together. They encourage one another. They pool their resources together to do the work that God has designed local churches to do. We see the organization of that in a passage like Philippians 1, where he says he writes to the church at Philippi with its overseers and deacons and then the saints that are there as well. So these individuals, Christians, who have come into a right relationship with God by, by the blood of Christ are part of the universal church. They are part of the body of Christ. And then they agree to work together in a congregation like this or congregations that we know of throughout the world. So let's, let's make this case uh, first, that there is a distinction made in the scriptures between the individual, the members of a local congregation, and then the local congregation as a whole. And that's why I've had you turn to Matthew chapter 18, because this, this is not a, a passage about the, the money that a church uses or the, uh, the resources that they have, but it does show us that, that the individual and the congregation, they're not the same thing. And they don't do things in the same way. And that there are certain things that an individual can do and must do that it's really not appropriate for the local congregation to do, at least at a given moment. So in Matthew 18 and verse 15, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen and a tax collector, a heathen and a publican. All right, so notice that there is a distinction here between an individual, a few members of a local church, and then the church as a whole. Now, why is that important? Because if we don't appreciate the distinction between individuals and local churches, we won't apply Matthew 18 correctly. Right? If we immediately say, well, anything that a local church, anything an individual can do, a local church can do. Well, then we, then we jump right to the very last step of this process instead of starting at the beginning of this process. Now, my point here is only to say this, that we have to be able to discern between what God tells individuals to do and what God tells local churches to do, even when we're looking at passages like things that re regard church discipline. So this is not just about money, and it's not just about the works that churches can do. 
There's a lot in the scriptures that depends on us being able to discern between what individuals are supposed to be doing and what local churches are supposed to be doing. And let me make the case to you now that the vast majority of things that God has asked us to do, he's asked us to do on an individual level, right? Loving our wives, raising our children, working our jobs, paying our taxes, right? Those are things he's called us to do on an individual level before we ever think about the work we're doing in a collective way. Now, secondly, there is a distinction made between the individual's money and the congregation's money. Now, you might think, well, we're all, it's all of our money. We're just putting it in one collective pot. You know, we're putting it in one collective treasury. Anything that we could do individually, we must be able to do with the collective because that's all of our money just added up together. But that's not how the scriptures view people's money. Uh, look over in Acts 5, and this is a, a markedly negative example, uh, of course. This is the case of Ananias and Sapphira. And Evidently, what had happened is Ananias and Sapphira wanting to get the praise that Barnabas had gotten in chapter 4 about selling his land and giving that to the apostles, decided they were going to sell a piece of their property and they were going to give it to the apostles. Now, notice what happens. This is in verse 1. A, man, a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira and his wife sold a possession and kept back part of the price and his wife also being privy to it and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied to men, but to God. All right. So Ananias sells the property. It looks to me like he had said, all the proceeds from this land sale I'm going that I get, I'm going to give to the apostles. I'm going to lay at the apostles' feet. But then when the time actually came, he laid a certain part of it, but left the impression that this was all of it. Now, here's where I want to key in in verse 4. While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? All right. While it was Ananias and Sapphira's, they had control over what happened to that money. They had decision-making authority over that money. But once it was in there, once it was uh, entrusted, once it was committed to the Lord, now there's different rules that apply. Now, we don't see all those different rules as they're applied here, but I want you to see the distinction that's being made. While you had it, it was yours. Then it wasn't yours once you dedicated it, once you entrusted it to the Lord. Look over in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, and maybe we can add to this. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. In verse 1, Paul says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, notice that, concerning the collection for the saints, that, that'll be important later. As I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, the New American Standard says, upon the first day of every week, let each one of you lay by in store as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. All right, so you have... Paul giving instructions to the church at Corinth that each one of the members, as they work each week and as they prosper, as they make money in a given week, that they take a portion of that and they set it aside so that it can be for the collection for the saints. Now, some have suggested that all Paul is saying here is that they just put this aside in a shoebox or under the mattress or in a Ziploc bag in the freezer, right? That they, just, that they take this and personally designate it as for the saints, but I think there's more to it than that because he says, so that there are no collections when I come. If I've just got my money stored in my freezer and then Paul comes around, there still has to be a collection made, even if I've designated that money. So it seems, from what we can tell in the text, that what they're doing is they're pooling that money together. That there's a distinction made between what you make as you prosper and then what you contribute out of that, out of that, that God has given you for the work of this local congregation. So first of all, there's, there's a clear distinction throughout the scriptures between the individual and a local church, what an individual can do and what a church can do. There's a distinction made between an individual's money and the church's money. And finally, there are some works that need to be handled on an individual level so that the church can focus on the work that it really has to do. Um, there, there, there's a distinction that's made between the work that an individual is responsible for 
and the work that a church is responsible for. So there was, uh, I, I, I read uh, at one point, there was a man who made the argument that anything that an individual is authorized to do, a local church is thereby authorized to do. Now, we could take that to, to some pretty outrageous places. Right? We can take that in some directions that I don't think that brother wanted to go. But what I want you to see here is that in First Thess First Timothy chapter 5, we have a very clear example of something that an individual must do that a local church is not allowed to do, cannot do. So in First Timothy chapter 5 and verse 3, honor widows that are widows indeed. The word honor there, if I understand correctly, is talking about kind of a permanent support. Here is a widow who is a widow indeed, has nobody else that they can depend on. And Paul says, if a widow indeed, she has to meet certain character qualifications and has to be utterly dependent. If, in, if that's the case, then the church can bring her into the permanent care of the local congregation, can support her like we would support our own mother, like we would support our own grandmother. The church can take her as a church mother in some sense and support her out of its treasure. But if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and to requite their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. If I die, let's hope it's a while after now, and Leo, Lennox, and Locke are productive members of society, as they ought to be, right? If it would be a shame, right, if the three of them fail to provide for Lydia and, and somebody else has to make provision for her, right, that would be an embarrassment. And that's what the text, here's verse 8, if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the face and is worse than an infidel, right? It is their responsibility first to take care of her if I'm gone. But what if there's a situation where here is a woman who has no one else to depend on, has nobody else that can take care of her? Notice this in verse 16. If any man or woman that believes have widows, let them relieve them. And let not the church be charged that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. Imagine this scenario. I've got, I've got three boys. They're all in their 20s. They have jobs. They're making money. They're supporting their own families. And then, but they refuse to take care of their mother. And so she has to be taken care of by the local congregation. And then here comes a widow who really doesn't have anybody to depend on. Who has no children that are alive. And the local church here has to say, I'm sorry, we can't help you because we're, we're helping this plowler over here. Well, that would be a tragedy because she should have three boys that are providing for her. And so what, the, what Paul is saying here, what the text is saying is, is the, work ha the, the church has a work to do. And it cannot be funneling its resources to other works because that would keep it from doing the work it really needs to do. There are some things that the church needs to be able to do that it cannot do if it has to meet everybody's individual responsibility too. And notice the distinction that is made between those works. Now, is it good for people to take care of their widows? Absolutely. But just because something is good to do does not make it the church's work to do. And that's a key concept. It doesn't make it immoral. It doesn't make it ungodly. It doesn't make it bad. It doesn't make us not want to, not concerned about it. But it's not the church's work. There are some things that are an individual's job to do and not a church's job to do. So how do we know if a church is authorized to engage in a particular activity? Just like we'd find out that something was our responsibility. That something is our activity to be engaged in. We'd go through the scriptures and we would find what God told, showed, and implied. But this time, instead of looking specifically for me, we'd be looking at local churches. What does God tell local churches to do? What does he show us that local churches did with his approval? And what implications does he leave that churches should be involved in these sorts of things? And we'll look at these quickly because I think this will be a refresher for most folks. But if you if you want to talk about any of this, I would be happy to talk about it more. Uh, we see the support, the preaching of the gospel. Um, in Philippians 4, verse 15 and 16, Paul writes to the group at Philippi. And I like this because obviously there are multiple members at the church at Philippi. Right? There are at least a couple because there's some people that are fighting, right? Unless they're schizophrenic, then we've got a whole other thing. But there are at least several people at part of the congregation at Philippi. 
But notice how he refers to what they sent as the gift that you sent. Right? So here's a collective action on the part of the people at Philippi. They pool their resources together to send a gift to Paul. They're working together in that regard. Um, in their assemblies, they come together in order to edify one another. So this is in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, down in verse 26. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, a teaching, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done for edifying. So is it appropriate for us to come together in a situation like this, for us to teach and to pray and to sing and to admonish in a way that would be edifying to everybody? Absolutely. That is one of the things that we see churches directly instructed to do. Um, providing for saints with physical needs. Uh, we see this, I think there are nine different passages in the New Testament that refer to taking care of the physical needs of the saints on the part of a local congregation. Uh, the first time we see that is in Acts chapter 2, and this is immediately uh, in the wake of uh, the, the, the conversion on the day of Pentecost, and in chapter 2, verse 44, all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat meat with singleness, gladness and singleness of heart. Um, something else. Disciplining unruly members is something that we see churches instructed to do. 1 Corinthians 5. We won't take the time to look at it, but Paul says when you come together, he says you deliver this one to Satan so that his soul can be saved. And we see churches engaged in worshiping God. Still in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. That's a partnership. They're joining together in this, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. All right. Now, this list is not inspired. I wrote this list down, and I am not inspired. This list is a list that I put together based on what I could find things that God instructed local churches to do in the New Testament. Could there be other things on the list? Absolutely, right? But how would something make it onto the list? It would make it onto the list if we could find a Bible passage that pointed to that being the work of, of the church. I, I'm sure that there's things that, and we could be more specific on a lot of these, like worshiping God. There are things underneath that that we could add to it. But in order to say that something belongs on the list of church activities, I hope this makes sense. We would have to find a Bible passage that either told us, showed us, or implied to us that this is something that a church ought to be engaged in. Let me make this point. It is good. It is reasonable. It is right for any group, collective, or organization to focus on its task and not on other tasks that are not its task, even if they are good tasks. It is right for any organization to focus on the job that it has been entrusted to do. Uh, my mother worked for the American Cancer Society uh, just before and, and uh, just before I was born. And uh, what would happen if you called the American Cancer Society and asked them to donate to some charitable organization that didn't have anything to do with cancer treatment or, or research? I have a pretty good feeling they would say no. Right? You say, uh, would you please donate to our uh, you know, soup kitchen or whatever. Now, does that mean they're against soup? Well, I'm sure it doesn't. Does it mean they're against feeding people soup? I would say no. But it doesn't follow the mission that they have set for themselves. It's not why people donate money to the American Cancer Society. Right? When they do some kind of fundraiser or when they ask for donations, they are telling people, when you donate money to us, we are trying to research and treat cancer. Right? That's our job. And if they were to take the money that people donate for the treatment and research of cancer and donate it to some other good but not cancer-related charity, it would be a distraction from their goal. It would be a disservice to the people who have entrusted their money to them for that purpose. Now, whether or not they are consistent of that, I don't know. But it makes sense that they would be and that they could be. So I want you to think about some things that are conspicuously not on the list. 
And when I say they're not on the list, I couldn't find a passage that would serve as a biblical warrant for adding it to the list. That doesn't mean there's not one. That doesn't mean I didn't miss it. But I couldn't find it. So, first of all, the social and recreational needs of the members and of the community. Now, think with me here. If there was one passage that indicated that social and recreational needs were part of the work of the church, then that would be approved and we should direct resources towards accomplishing that, right? If there was one passage. But as far as I can tell, we do not see local churches in the New Testament being saddled with that responsibility. And in fact, as we go through, it looks to me like there's a distinction being made. So in Acts 2 verse 42, you may still be there, I don't know. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of the bread, literally, and in prayers. But then look at verse 46. Continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. So there is a fellowship, there is a sharing that they're involved in, the breaking of the bread, referencing the Lord's Supper. But then there's a breaking of bread from house to house. So it's not that social concerns are irrelevant. It's not that recreational things are, are, are illegitimate. It's just they're not associated with the work that the local church is doing together. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 11, as Paul is addressing concerns about the Lord's Supper, one of the things he says is, don't you have houses to eat and drink in? Now, his main point there is not to draw a distinction necessarily between the individual and the local congregation. But the point he makes is, is that when you come together here, it's for spiritual activities. And that you have places for belly satisfying meals. right? You have places to get full. This is not that. So there's a distinction that's being made between the kinds of activities we're engaged in. Uh, what about political activism and social reform? Now, will Christians have an effect on society? For sure. Ye are the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. I think about Philippians 2 verse 15. that talks about the fact as we, as we don't complain, as we don't grumble, that we shine as lights in the middle of a crooked and perverse generation. But how is that influence done? As far as I can tell, there's no evidence from the New Testament that first century churches, with God's approval, dedicated money or resources to political activism or overturning social, uh, social orders or anything like that. What about benevolence outside the body of Christ? And maybe this one surprises folks the most. Uh, I, I read one time, uh, it was on a, a, a tweet or something, and it said, a church that doesn't care for the physical needs of its community has missed the point. <laughs> They're making a pretty uh, bold statement for something that I can't find any evidence that local churches engaged in in the New Testament. Financial assistance to those outside of the body of Christ. There are some passages that people point to, but I think a look at the context will ind indicate that while individuals are given that responsibility, the local church isn't. So let's look at James 1.27. This is a passage very often that is referenced in this regard. James 1 and verse 27 says, Pure religion and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Somebody says, well, if it's involved in pure and undefiled religion, surely a church can be a part of it. Well, first of all, we have no indication that these widows and orphans aren't necessarily part of the local congregations that James is writing to. But the other thing is, notice this, verse 26, If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but to see that with his own heart, this man's religion is vain. What are we talking about? We're talking about local churches? It doesn't look like that to me. In verse 27, Pure religion and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself or oneself unspotted from the world. This is about your job. This is your task. Another is uh, Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith. And some well-meaning folks, I think, will say, look, it says we. It says us. This is a collective. But it's talking about a collective as Christians, not churches. Look up in, uh, in Galatians chapter 6 and... Uh, let me turn there as well. Galatians chapter 6 
and verse 7. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. We're talking about an individual responsibility here. So, verse 9, let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As churches? Not really. That's not the main point here. As individuals. But he's talking to them as a collective. Verse 10, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith. That is, that's our job as individuals. And the local church has its work to do. Uh, I'm running out of time. Maybe I have run out of time, but I'm going to pretend I'm just running out of time. Um, an illustration that was helpful to me. Uh, Brother Sewell Hall was the one I heard use this illustration. What's the role of a hospital? It's to heal sick people. But if you go to the hospital, you're going to find a fire extinguisher. And you might say, but I thought the hospital was supposed to heal sick people, not put out fires. What medical procedure uses a fire extinguisher? <laughs> it would be, it'd be a sight to see. Um, but you and I both know that in order to be able to heal sick people, the hospital has to be prepared to put out fires that happen within the hospital. It's seriously going to limit their ability to heal sick people if there's fires all over the place. But what if the hospital and their staff went around the neighborhood using that fire extinguisher to put out fires? What do we say about that? We'd say that'd be silly because it would take away from the hospital's ability to heal sick people. Individual employees can join a volunteer fire department if they think that putting out fires in the neighborhood is an important thing to do. But that's not the job. That's not the hospital putting out fires. Its job is to heal sick people. All right. What's the role of the church? I'd say that the primary task the church has been assigned is to help spiritually sick people. Proclaiming the gospel, edifying its members, glorifying God. But the church has authority, has permission to help needy people within the church. But I thought the church was supposed to help spiritually sick people, not give people money. You and I both know that in order to help spiritually sick people, sometimes the church must be prepared to address emergencies that come up among its members, maybe with the very basic necessities. But what if churches just go around giving money throughout the neighborhood? We would say that that would be a distraction from the mission of the local church because it would take away from its church from the church's ability to help heal spiritually sick people. Individual members can and must, based on the passages that we've just looked at, must help needy in the community. But that's not the church putting out fires. Its job is to help spiritually sick people. So are these things bad things to be involved in? Not necessarily. And in some cases, absolutely not depending on the way you engage in political activism or recreational activities, we could say you shouldn't do that, but not necessarily bad things. But they're not the work the church has been given to do. We have the most important task before us. The proclamation of the gospel of Christ. The building up of Christ's body in this place. The glory of our Creator. That's the work that we have been given to do. And far be it from us to divert the resources that have been dedicated to that task to things that are not our work to do. There is a place for social and recreational activities. There is a place for political and social societal activity. There is a place for benevolent work. But based on what we see in the New Testament, these are primarily realms for individual activity and not for the congregation. But the vast majority of work that God has given us to do is on the individual level. That's why it's so important for all of us to recognize the authority that Christ has over us and that we live in submission to His Lordship in every facet of our life, including when we come together in the work we do here. Now, we'll have other lessons along these lines from time to time, but I thought that was a helpful thing to think about this morning, that we need to be aware of what God has asked us to do and the work that God has asked us as a group to do as we work together. It may be that you have not lived with a full recognition of Christ's authority over you. That you have not yielded your spirit in every way to the God who made us and who has redeemed us. And if you find places in your life where you are not willing to submit to His authority, you need to repent. You need to turn away from whatever it is that is dictating your life and you need to surrender to the authority of Jesus Christ. And we want to help. 
If we can show you how to be more fully obedient to the Lord's commands, we want to. Because we want to build each other up and encourage each other to be everything that God wants us to be. And if we can help you with that this morning, won't you come while we stand and while we sing? Thanks for watching. If you found this video to be beneficial, please follow us on Facebook or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Feel free to share it with others that you feel like may benefit from it. If you need to contact us, please contact us via email at quinn.church at yahoo.com. Also, if you're in the area, we would love for you to come visit with us at one of our assemblies. Have a good day.